Once again, we'd like to welcome you to today's Ripple webinar. I'd like to turn things over to your host for today's session, Mr. Nick Stein, Director of Content and Media at Ripple. Nick? Thanks very much, Rich, and uh, welcome everyone to the latest webinar in Ripple's Leadership Series. Um, we are really excited to have Suzanne Rotondo and Gretchen Smeltzer from Taleos uh, back with us for part two of our three-part series um, on coaching with compassion. Um, Taleos is a, is a very well-regarded leadership consulting and executive coaching firm, um, and Suzanne and Gretchen joined us um, last month to really kick off this discussion about coaching um, and how you can be more effective as a coach with your direct reports. Um, before I, I turn things over to Suzanne and Gretchen, I just wanted to say a few words about today's subject, um, coaching. Uh, there's a recent survey of 90,000 workers in 18 countries by the global HR consultancy Towers Watson. And what they discovered was that only 21% of these workers were engaged in the sense that they would go the extra mile for their employer. Um, now, this is a huge concern for companies, and, and the reason why is that uh, people have estimated the lost productivity that's attributed to disengaged employees in the U.S. alone costs corporations about $300 billion a year. Um, so how do, we, how do we deal with this engagement or this lack of engagement issue? Um, the problem is you can't just tell your employees to become more engaged, and research has shown you can't just pay them more either. In fact, a, a, a recent study by McKinsey found that non-financial incentives like attention from a boss or opportunities for leadership and advancement were actually far more effective drivers than stock options or a bump in salary. Um, so when it comes to the workplace, um, we need to create an environment in which this type of, uh, of coaching uh, can happen so that engagement levels uh, among employees can improve. But what employees often get these days instead of a coach is, is more of a manager, someone who kind of pops in occasionally to tell them what they did wrong. Uh, so instead of feeling like they've been mentored, workers end up dreading the next run-in they're going to have with the boss. And the boss, meanwhile, is frustrated that they couldn't correct course in time to make any real changes. So here at Ripple, um, we believe employees need managers to coach them in the moment rather than after the fact. It should be something that's happening continuously. So we've designed a private shared space for managers and employees to keep track of all those coaching interactions. So employees don't need to keep digging through their old emails to figure out what their boss may have told them uh, or to send frequent emails to keep their boss up to date on what they're doing and how they're progressing against their goals. Uh, Ripple keeps all of these things things in real time organized in one place. So now that we've sort of established that, that coaching is important and, and Ripple can provide a place for, for you to do that, how do you actually give your employee guidance uh, when you have them uh, with you in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And that's where today's guests come in. Um, Suzanne and Gretchen have coached and offered leadership advice to some of the best-known, most well-respected organizations in the world. Um, and we are very fortunate to have them back today uh, for the second part in our three-part series on coaching. And so I'd just like to to welcome them and say say thank you and, and let you guys take it from here. Thanks, Nick. Great, Nick. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Suzanne from Telios and Gretchen. We're really happy to be here with you today. Um, thanks for that great introduction. Often we, um, we spend our time uh, starting to launch the conversation around making a case for where engagement plays in terms of results in companies. So we appreciate you bringing in the latest research on that 
there's plenty of plenty more where that came from, and we'll be addressing some of that around climate today and also around one-on-one coaching. Great, great. So uh, first is the polling. Let's see where in the world you are calling in from. Let's see. So you have some choices here, and we know we haven't covered everything. Okay, we'll take another minute here to see where people are calling in from. And while we're waiting for that, well, uh, this is Gretchen Schmelzer, um, and we'll just start by looking at uh, how you can get the most out of today's webinar. And we ask you to be here so, you know, just for a moment, take a deep breath, settle into your chair or wherever you are. Um, know that you have this time to be with us and be with the, the large group that's on the phone, um, and we'll find out from where. But, and uh, be open to what you're learning and to what you might be surprised by. Have a notebook or a pen to write down things if it would be helpful to you, and know that this will be available on the web later so you won't, don't need to get everything down and be willing to commit to action. So we're really putting this out there so that people can use it and practice it and experiment with it. Okay, so it looks like we have our results in. We have uh, quite a few from the U.S. We also have 14% uh, from Canada and 5% from Europe. So thanks for, to those of you who filled us in. We have some variety of where people are coming from. And uh, if you've been on this call before, um, stick with us for a minute. As you know, there is a call to action at the end, and we're going to take you through that. Um, but we're going to do a quick review now of right. some of the, the points we hit on at the first one. And just for those who might be joining us um, for the first time, a, a little bit about Telios Leadership Institute. We were founded a little over 10 years ago by Annie McKee and Francis Johnson. Um, we are scholar pr practitioners as a group, and we work both as executive coaches and also as leadership development experts. Um, we work based on research, so uh, research based in neuropsychology, group, di group dynamics, emotional intelligence. Um, we work both nationally and internationally. We work with Fortune 100 firms and we work with large nonprofits. So we pretty much cover the spectrum. Um, we are thought leaders in leadership, um, and have published a number of books and articles. Okay. Now, if you joined us for the first webinar, we started by going over the mindset and preparation for uh, the work you'd be doing with your direct reports. Um, and we gave you a bunch of different activities to do, which we'll go over. And really helping your direct reports start the conversation about what their aspirations were, what their ideal self was. And today we're going to be reviewing those reflections, understanding how coaching manager impacts climate, and um, setting you up for another com set of conversations with your direct report about how to really look at what their actual current strengths and challenges are. And then we'll set you up for another assignment, and when we come back for the third webinar, um, we'll be working and looking at what the path forward is, designing goals, and tracking learning. So what we'll cover today is we're going to review the mindset of a coaching manager and tying in what Nick was talking about in terms of really how to engage people and why it matters that you coach with compassion and you are engaging your direct reports in a different way. We're going to explore how leaders set climate in organizations, how you as a leader really impact the environment that people work in, that you work in and all the other people work in, and see how climate actually affects the end result. So that was the $300 billion a year that's not getting made this year that Nick was talking about. And then we'll get uh, really specific about the second part of, of the conversations that you can have with your direct reports uh, in terms of coaching a compassion developmental process. So what is a, uh, the mindset of a coaching manager? 
a coaching manager really is about investing energy in your direct reports, and it's seeing them on a developmental curve or arc. It's not just about delivering results for the company, although we think that's really important, but it's also about helping them get connected to what motivates them, what drives them, what they're passionate about, and seeing how their contributions not only can help their work, but also help the trajectory of their career. And it's also about connecting them with the intersection of their strengths and the organizational needs. So how can they contribute what they have to to the, the workplace, and how can the workplace benefit from that and contribute back to them? So it is a, a mutual interaction. And Gretchen, if I could just add to that, this piece around non-financial incentives, it's something a lot of executives ask us about in terms of how do we motivate our people, do we set goals and tie them to financial, um, financial benefits. And what the research has shown and what uh, reality has borne out is that you only get so much out of that. So the emphasis that's happening all across industries at, at various levels with managers in this movement in coaching the coaching manager and more and more people moving toward that is this idea of how do you move beyond relying on financial incentives to drive behavior. So this coaching, this coaching thing that we're talking about is far beyond performance. This is really how you get people to start paying attention to what they need to feel connected to their work and to really give it their all. Yeah. And you play a big role in that. It's so important. We did a big research project in a very large financial firm about five years ago. And the uh, leaders that we were interviewing were making significant amounts of money as financial leaders. And one of the biggest things that they were concerned about was that their boss didn't pay enough attention to them, that, they, that instead of a bonus, they wanted their boss to take them out to dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it really, it really struck me at the time about how important it is that managers and bosses and leaders know their people and how much of a benefit that is to the, the direct report below them. Great. So what does a coaching manager do? And I think this is, it's important here to think about what the distinction is between just a man, what we think a manager does versus a coaching manager. And a coaching manager creates conditions for a person to maximize her performance or potential. It's, it's about setting a climate or an environment. It's about creating space for conversations and creating space for people to, uh, to learn and grow within their job. The uh, coaching manager helps a person move from his or her current situation to where they want to be. And the, in order to do that, you have to take into account uh, where they are and where they want to go. You have to actually know that and have those conversations with them. A coaching manager behaves in a way that creates trust, uh, if they're respectful, they're curious, they're open, they're consistent, they behave and model the, the way they want their climate and the other people around them to behave. And they set a climate for the team, the department, and the organization. They really create a space where people can flourish. Right. So if we take this, um, this concept of climate a bit further, and we'll spend the next few minutes looking at this, um, you know, we really make a distinction between people who help people manage getting tasks done and managers who actually invest themselves in the development of their people, actually invest themselves in their people. Climate is something that's a little hard to put your finger on, but there are a lot, there's been many, many attempts at trying to define it. So we're going to actually take you through what we mean by climate and culture, what the role of the leader is in determining that, and why that's so important for coaching managers to pay attention to. It's part of what, um, what we heard Nick talk a little bit about around institutionalizing behaviors. Climate is one of the ways that you do that by creating a set of circumstances and a context and behaviors that you model and reinforce that actually start to make that kind of feedback process and developmental process part of the way business gets done. So <clears throat> on a department or organizational level, a coaching manager sets or, or a leader sets the climate. So we talked last time, if you recall, um, so far much of this has been reviewed, but if you recall, we talked about the role of emotions from a neuropsychological perspective 
Emotions are contagious. Um, when people aren't changing, it's, not, it's often not an information problem, right? But it's a connection with something bigger and more important to them kind of issue. Um, so the emotion that you carry around, the emotions that you foster, the emotions that you um, um, bring out in the people who report to you affect culture and climate. And in fact, a lot of studies have been done, and the number that it's come to is 30% of performance and organizational results can be attributed to culture and climate. So the leader plays a big role. Now, another number I don't have in here is that 70% of what determines culture is set by the leader. So if you start to do the math on that, leaders have a, a, a sort of disproportionate effect on what happens in terms of how it feels in a place. So what is climate? This is a working definition that I think can make it pretty tangible. It's recurring patterns of behavior, right, attitudes and feelings that characterize life in an organization. In other words, what it feels like in a place. I don't know if you've gone on interviews in your life and you walk into a place and you just know, I could never work here. Or you walk into a place and you say, I could see working here. What is it that you're picking up on? That's not cognitive necessarily. It's certainly not based on conversation. You're actually still in the waiting room waiting for your interview to start. There is something that we can pick up on that is actually a pretty powerful force. Um, and it's not a force by accident. It can actually be intentionally designed. And that's what we're going to try to work with you on today, about taking an interest in mindfully creating the climate you need to have the team and department do the things that you think are in the best interest of the organization and also in each individual's best interest. So what motivates us? The reason climate matters so much, and what Nick was referring to earlier, is if 21% of people only are engaged, if only 21% of the workforce will go that extra mile for companies, how do we start to affect that number? And for that 21%, what happened to make the culture sticky for them? To make them, are they just born that way? Or is there some, something happening for them that actually brings out this sense of wanting to go in the extra mile for the organization? Understanding individually what motivates people is very important and a big part of why we encourage these developmental conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations where you stay in a curious, inquiry-oriented mindset. What does motivate people personally? What matters to them? There are also some universal truths about what motivates us. And those are some of the things we're going to touch on now that maybe can be applied more broadly. The main idea around climate and motivation is an engagement is that there is an enormous gap or gulf between what employees do to get by and what they can do when they're at their full potential. In fact, <clears throat> we call that discretionary effort. A positive climate encourages discretionary effort. So it comes in the form of commitment to the organization. People spend that extra time, am I going to go home or am I going to make this extra call or set up this extra meeting or do this one extra thing? It also allows people to feel the freedom or the energy that they need for creativity. Coaching managers play an enormous role in setting a positive climate. It's something we touched on last time, and yes, it happens through, to, through feedback and through demonstrating to people that you're engaged with them on their developmental trajectory. And it also comes from the vibe or just the sense that you create that people can feel when they're waiting for their interview to start. So coaching managers play an incredibly important role. The reverse is also true. Negative climates can really squash that discretionary effort. Um, I'm coaching someone right now who constantly, she manages talent for uh, an entertainment firm. She, so much of her work is discretionary. Is she going to go out and watch a new band? Is she going to go to, uh, to an event where she can hobnob with people? Is she going to go to these things that will allow her to grease the wheels and identify talent or not? Every night there are multiple opportunities for her to do more and more and more. And as things have gotten more pressured, more stressful, less certain, when her boss has gotten more distant, when it's up to her to make that decision, she's more often now choosing not to do it. That's the role that a, a leader and a climate can play in terms of people making decisions to go forward with something and give that extra inch or not. So what makes a climate? Sometimes people think it's kind of hardwired into an organization. 
But you can imagine, and we've all been in these places, where in one department of the same organization, people could be floundering. Things could be um, hard to read. It feels more political. People don't really know where they stand with their boss. And in another department in the same organization, sometimes on the same floor in the building, there's a completely different sense of how people fit in, what their priorities are, being able to get their job done, and have a sense of commitment to their organization and to their own growth. So it's not about resources. These, these two departments are not necessarily differently resourced. They are conceivably part of the same mission, although the leaders within those departments may articulate it differently or not at all. And the pressures are likely not enormously different. They may vary a bit, but they're not enormously different. So what in that scenario would account for the difference? Well, there's tons of research on this, and um, some of the research that I like to rely on comes from the Hay Group, where <coughs> they've found and identified, and so have others, many, six major factors that affect climate. And they're actually things that you can affect as a manager. So these aren't things that rely on the CEO or the chairman of the board or um, the shareholders necessarily or at all. It actually is within your span of control as a manager. Now, not always to the fullest extent, but always to some extent and in some cases to quite an extent. So we're going to take you through these one at a time. Gretchen, anything you want to add before I go on? Okay. So clarity. So there's, there's six of these. Clarity is the first one. If you didn't get them all, um, I, I will go, be going through them one at a time. Clarity is, is simply designed de, de, uh, defined as everyone in the organization knows what's expected of them. It sounds so simple. But I bet if we were to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with each person on this webinar right now and said, can you clearly articulate what it is that's expected of you, we would find a lot of variation. Oh, Suzanne, I just want to jump in and say I think a lot of our research that we do in organizations, we find that the, one of the number one themes that shows up is role clarity. What, what is my boss expected of, expecting of me? Mm -hmm. Right, and that may be how do I fit into the vision right. for the whole company. That may be how do I fit into the vision of this department. Right. What are my priorities? How do, and it links to how do I know I'm doing a good job. Right. So part of the ability, this discretionary effort, is when I know I'm doing a good job, I feel motivated. It's self-motivating. Right. So having clarity about what I'm doing allows me to do that. Right. Rather than acting and contributing into some vortex that you're never really sure if it, if it hit the mark. Right. I'm working hard. I'm on a treadmill. Right. But I don't know where I'm going. Right. 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 So the coaching manager has a big role to play in the clarity, which really requires conversation. It requires empathy and transparency. Without it, people make stories up. It's just what we do as humans. So in the absence of information, I'm going to be looking for body language from you. I'm going to read between the lines in your emails. I'm going to try to pay attention to how you're working with other people. Are there any clues for me? He gave her this project and not me. What does that mean? Versus you going in and saying, you know what, let's just be completely clear. What do you think your responsibilities are? And what do you think the expectations are? What do you expect of yourself? And what do you expect of me as your manager? Let's get clear about the, the contract between us. And then let's stay in touch around it. So Ripple is very helpful in that it can allow you to lay out expectations and also check in frequently. Weekly meetings can do that. There are many, many mechanisms for this. It can also be woven into the developmental conversations you have. But the main point here is do not assume people know. We work with executive teams a lot. And we'll often ask each one of them privately, what do you think the strategy is? Do you think you know it? And they say, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm good, clear on the strategy. Well, what is it? And without exception, they all say something slightly different or vastly different. And we tell the CEO, and the CEO doesn't believe us. The CEO says, that's impossible. We talk about, I talk about the strategy every meeting in the vision. Well, it turns out you're not, you can't be sure it's landing unless you check. And even if they get the strategy, most often those executives or the people who may report to you don't understand where they fit in. Okay. So we'll move on to the next one, standards. It might sound like a dry word, but it's very orienting for the people who work in an organization. Setting challenging but attainable goals, right? And then supporting people to meet those goals. So yes, these are maybe deliverables, but they're more than deliverables. 
What we would say to you is the role of a coaching manager in establishing a climate of standards is that you have these powerful develop developmental goals set. And as we'll see in the third webinar, there is a way to find an intersection between what people most want, what motivates them most, and what the organization needs. And when you can find those sweet spots, everybody's winning and things are really moving along in a way that you just feel like you've finally nailed it. Yeah, in order to add to this, Suzanne, the, the, I think this hooks with clarity in some ways in the sense that I find coaching people or coaching teams, I often end up asking the question, what is the outcome you want? Mm -hmm. Because as you're saying, people aren't always clear about what the differences are. And when the manager is really clear about the standard of the outcome, mm -hmm. then people can judge themselves off the standard. And it's not, it's not based on whether somewhat, somebody likes it or doesn't like it or right. the politics or if there are clear standards to measure what you're working off. Right, right. Yep, and something to go back to and say, how are we doing? Right. Yeah, and I would just say very quickly, challenging but attainable is an important phrase. Because you don't want to be, you don't want to let people off too easy. We know when we're not being challenged, but they have to be attainable. You're not going to get someone to change their entire skill set or personality or do something that you can't even do in your role. So it's, you'll see some of the other pieces that fit into this, but keep that in mind, challenging but attainable goals. The next one is responsibility. This is kind of interesting, I think, to think about differently. The way that we think about responsibility in here is that employees are given authority and a span of control. So in other words, if you stepped out of the picture entirely, they should be able to get done what they are responsible for without having to, to twist any arms or go behind any, go into some deep bureaucratic mess. They should be able to have influence enough to be able to do the things they're responsible for. Now in some cases, they may have to leverage matrix relationships or peers in a way that requires finesse and influence skills. Nonetheless, they should have a span of control that allows them to do what they're clearly understanding as their responsibility. So what does that mean? That means that you don't micromanage. I read a really interesting piece today on HBR about micromanaging. And it basically said, if you're going to micromanage, don't micromanage tasks, micromanage the relationship. Right? Pay attention to the details of the relationship you have with your direct reports, and then set them free. We often get it backwards. We pay very little attention to the relationship, but we micromanage the heck out of tasks. We've got to start flipping that, and that's something a coaching manager can be very aware of. Um, we move on to flexibility, number four. Um, this is very, quite simply around bureaucracy. There are no unnecessary rules, policies, and procedures. As a coaching manager, this is something you can really go to the mat on for your people. You know, not making it too hard for them to work from home if you expect them to get things done and they are raising small children. Give them a way to do it where it's not forbidden or they don't have to jump through, you know, hundreds of hoops to do it. Limit the bureaucracy. What it does is it saves them effort and it also encourages them to do things without saying, this is just a waste, it's going to get the kibosh anyway. It's key to, to creativity. It seems so rudimentary, but it actually is something that wastes a lot of time and wastes a lot of goodwill. So as a coaching manager, you can pay attention to that. Rewards. Clearly, this is something that ties into the last webinar, which is around recognition and acknowledgement for good performance. The other piece of this is honest, consistent feedback, something that Nick talked about at the beginning. So paying attention to people through this developmental process is wonderful. It's essential. But doing it often is also essential. And that may just be about small things. You've spent time on clarity. You've spent time setting standards that are challenging but attainable. You've given them the room to run. You've gotten unnecessary bureaucracy out of their way. Now it's time to check in about it. And that is within your control. So you can model these behaviors as a coaching manager, right? Recognize behaviors that support the direction you said you wanted to go in, right? And purpose. And then support them in their development. Okay. The last one is team commitment. This is really one of those intangibles where, you know, we, everybody says it, but it bears repeating. We spend more time at work than anywhere else. Whether we like it or not, our key relationships are often at work and not at home. They might not be the most intimate or the most 
significant, but they are certainly the most common and where we put the most time in. So people want to feel proud about where they're putting their time, and they want to feel proud of their colleagues. So it's never, um, it's, it's never a given. You need to address that. You need to help people find the places where they can feel pride. You need to circulate stories. You need to give the team an opportunity to connect. So team building now, especially in the age of layoffs, I just posted a blog today on you know, how do you reconstruct and re-energize teams after layoffs. And one of the big findings is clearly that you have to create social networks get broken after layoffs. Mm -hmm. People are missing in the social web that they're used to having. Some of those people are missing now. You have to give people as a coaching manager, give people on your team opportunities to establish networks that support them, and that happens through time. And feedback is another way that people really find a uh, connection to the team. So don't assume that the team can see itself or understand its own strengths. Sometimes individuals can pay attention to their own individual strengths, so they get personal feedback, but often teams don't get that kind of feedback. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's really crucial. Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying as a team, give them group feedback. On give them group it. feedback, yeah. right. And also give some feedback to the individuals so that the, in front of the other individuals or through using Ripple or other ways in team meetings so that the team gets to know its own strengths. So right. they know that uh, Susan's really good at what she did, and, and she's on our team. Yeah, I can go to her. Right. 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 For X, Y, or Z. So what we're going to ask you to do now is to just take a minute here. We told you we were going to ask you to reflect a little bit or write um, and do, some, do a little bit of work here. I just want you to think for a minute about your vision for your group or your team. Again, I know not all of you manage people right now but many of you do and many of you will. So I want you to just think about what your vision is for your team over the next year or two or three. What are you hoping to see from them? And what kind of a climate would you need to make that happen? Take a minute to jot that down and then we're going to get into even a little bit more granularity in the next slide. In fact, I'll put it up for you. <clears throat> this is about your vision. What kind of a climate do you need to make that vision real? And then think about what you're communicating, daily or weekly. Are you noticing and acknowledging good work around you? And what do you do? How do you do that? What specific behaviors support that? And how are you contributing to a positive outlook? How are you lowering some of the hassles? Reducing stress, reducing uncertainty to the extent you can. So raising the good and lowering some of the negative. Just think about that. And we're going to actually ask you to <clears throat> submit some of your answers if you could. You don't have to do a whole long um, paragraph, but if you could just send in um, a few of the things you're thinking about, how you know that you're acknowledging it, what do you do to acknowledge the good work, what is your vision for your group, how do you think you're doing on this? Um, if you could submit some of that and or questions, we're going to just pause here for a couple minutes and and look at what you've done, um, and Nick is going to be uh, drawing out some of the questions. <laughs> so Nick, if you have some questions that have come up so far, feel free to bring those up. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um you know, we, you've you've talked um, about this idea of of recognition and and rewarding people as as a way to motivate them. And I think a, qu a question that a lot of people have is just around, um, you know, how how exactly do you do that? Because as you pointed out, um, the research really does show that once people get paid a certain amount. Um, giving them monetary or financial incentives, how we think about traditional rewards doesn't really work. And so what are some of the what are some of the intrinsic awards or recognition that you can give someone that will get them to provide that discretionary output that you were talking about? Thanks, Nick. 
Uh, I, this is Gretchen. I have a story, actually. I worked for an organization um, that helped teenage kids. And so people there actually weren't making very much money, and they couldn't reward them that way. It was no possibility. But each week they put out a newsletter, a one-page newsletter, acknowledging the staff members who went above and beyond for kids that week. And it, there were different staff, and they basically would say, you know, so-and-so went above and beyond this week to help out a kid in the following way, and they described the behavior. And though that newsletter cost virtually nothing, it went into every staff member's mailbox at the time, this was pre-email, and it really motivated people and made people feel like they mattered. Yep. That's a great example. There's a, another example <clears throat> that I've heard <clears throat> excuse me, quite a lot about, which is I think it was Caterpillar or Deer, but I, John Deere, but I think it was Caterpillar. They had Caterpillar bucks. And you got, every employee got 10 bucks. And over the course of the month, they had to spend them, and it couldn't be on themselves. They had to spend them when someone went above and beyond for them in some way. And at the end of the month, you, would, you, you could buy things at the company store. And they had real things, not just like a Caterpillar hat, but like, you know, <laughs> things you might actually want, like iTunes gift cards or whatever. And what became clear is certain people were buying a lot of stuff, and certain people weren't getting any bucks given to them. And so it gave two messages. One is it really did acknowledge the work that people did and gave them something real. And the other thing is people who weren't getting acknowledged that way really started to be able to notice and ask themselves why, and, and their managers could even ask, you know, what do you think is going on here? So that's maybe a little, not gimmicky, but a little bit high touch. Mm -hmm. um, the other ways that people can do it is truly carving out time to have those conversations with people. It does not have to be more than 15 minutes every two weeks mm -hmm. to sit down and talk with someone. What do you think is going well? What do you think we could be working on? What, don't, what aren't I aware of that you feel really good about? What should I be aware of that is going extremely well or that you feel is good for the organization or someone you worked with? Allow them to bring things to your attention and just be open to that. One thing that occurs to me is in the organizations and with some of the leaders we work with, there's almost a fear of positive feedback. Like if I tell them they're doing a good job for something that you know, they're supposed to be doing, it'll unmotivate them or I shouldn't have to. Mm -hmm. And it's really surprising how motivating it is to hear you're doing a good job. The positive feedback really does. Yeah, the research is just showing a lot that it's the carrot and not the stick. That speaks to this discretionary effort. So we know people are doing the minimum at least, or, they would, or they're on their way out. But really trying to leverage this discretionary effort, that is really where the difference between a standard manager and a coaching manager can make all the difference. Well, that's, I mean, that's really helpful um, insight. And it's its really interesting as well because, um, you know, with, with Ripple, one of the things that we allow people to do is to give thanks to their colleagues in a public way. And we've noticed two things, uh, two different things you guys pointed out. Number one is the social pressure aspect to it, that when people see others around them giving thanks in a public way to people for what they've done, it actually motivates them to, to start investing in that behavior themselves. Um, you know, as opposed to sending an email to someone saying, thanks for doing that great work and CCing their boss, where it really is a closed loop of two people, when you do it on right. Ripple in a public way, you now have everyone at the company can be a part of that and can be in a, you know, can engage in that discussion and be motivated by it. The, the second thing that we've noticed is that when that thanks or that recognition becomes a part of an employee's profile and really helps build their reputation. It's kind of an organic, real way that somebody is building a reputation at work 
based on the on the real feedback. So like the caterpillar example you gave, this is this is really what their coworkers think about them and that's incredibly valuable both from an individual empowerment perspective but also from an organizational perspective because you start to have visibility into you know who these people are that are working for you and what they're doing and what they're getting thanked for and what other people are recognizing them for and that gives you insight a real window into who these people are that are working for you and what and what they're capable of that's right that's so true right and also it for people who might not necessarily easily pick up on social cues it gives it models for them some of the things that are appreciated by other people <laughs> organization, <laughs> which is valuable. Thanks for that, Nick. That's really helpful. Sure. Um, um, and another, another. I don't know if you want to do one more question or if you want to move on to the rest no, of the sure. presentation. Right. Um, well, a, a question came in about um, about motivating a, a small team, and, and they're saying, you know, my vision is for us to be an incubator for innovation and breast practices that can be then be shared within the larger organization. Um, so I guess the, the question here is, you know, is sort of like, um, are, how, I guess, how do, you, how do you build on some of these behaviors and then share them in a, uh, in a much larger context? Well, I love the question. Um, and the innovation question is, you know, perpetually stumping um, to a lot of people. There's a couple of things that the neuropsych helps us understand. And if you were on the last webinar, I'll just be reminding this person, but maybe for those who weren't. You know, we, <clears throat> we shut down cognitively when we're under stress. So after layoffs or the feeling like there might be more layoffs, or you're not, are you going to get your next round of, uh, of funding? Um, you know, are the venture capitalists going to support you in the next round? There's, these kinds of stressors can actually inhibit our ability to think creatively. So it's really important that managers of creative teams try to um, shield their people from that as much as possible. You don't want to keep them in reality, but you also want to shield any unnecessary kinds of uncertainty or stress. That's thing one. Thing two is we know that people who have fun together <coughs> cognitively produce better results. It stimulates the same part of our brain that creates new ideas. So, um, you know, we laugh a lot about this term of, you know, thinking out of the box and out of the box. It's not just words. You actually have to do something different. So my suggestion is moving people. We often take people into the geography and where they, where they exist and find things in their world that they can see differently. That's around them all the time. So, you know, when we have a meeting in Warsaw, we take the executive team around Warsaw and go visit some of the important historical places or the, you know, exceptionally green building design that was just launched there that's the greenest building in the world. Um, you know, these people weren't architects that we were with. They were actually in a pretty, you know, in a manufacturing role. But for them, being in a place where people are doing things differently and kind of turning the crystal a different way sparks new thoughts. So as a manager, you can kind of create that climate of fun. You can create that climate of blocking stress as much as possible, and you can also actually physically bring people into spaces that help them think a little bit differently. And sometimes it's in a very practical way as simple as really looking at how people schedule their time. Innovation isn't an hourly task. That's a manager schedule. There are things that are slotted into time slots. And creative schedules often require runs of time, three or four hour chunks, where people can work on an idea or a project over a span of time and get into it enough to create something new and come out of it. And our daily schedules often inhibit innovation even though we're saying and doing all the right things. Yeah. So I don't know if that answered directly um, the question, um, but I hope it at least gave maybe sparked some ideas. Nick, anything else on that? Um, well, I think, you know, I think we should maybe let you guys get back to the the rest of the discussion. I can see we're we're coming up to a, the end of our time pretty soon. So, were there were there other things you were hoping to cover 
um, in in the presentation, or did you want to um, did you want to move right to a Q and A? No, we have a couple other things we're going to do. <clears throat> we'll get through it, and uh, and we have a poll right now just to get a sense as we transition back into this developmental process that you're taking your direct reports through. For those of you who were on the last webinar, can you just fill this out so we have a sense of whether or not you've actually initiated this with any of your direct reports and just how it's going so far? And while you're doing that, we'll have Gretchen uh, bring us through the rest. So I'm just going to go over the, the recap of the meetings that you had the last time. In the first meeting, you set the stage for the developmental framework. You set the stage for a coaching manager relationship, not just a manager relationship. And you assign three reflection exercises about aspirations, what's my noble purpose, the 27 things I want to do before my, I die, and me at my best. In the second meeting, the direct report brought back in the information from those three exercises, and you had a conversation about them. What was it like for them to do it? What themes did they notice? And what came out of that conversation? And at the end of that meeting, you assigned uh, task to, for them to notice the strengths they see in themselves and to think about that. And so now we're coming back in for meeting three that you'll set up with your direct report. And before this meeting, first reflect on what you heard from your direct report about the aspirations they talked about in the previous meeting. So when was your direct report at his or her best? What were the conditions? What stood out for you? What what surprised you about their aspirations or what, what sparked something in you about them? Um, what made you more curious? So one of the primary things is that before the meeting, you're going to take time before it to, to really think about your direct report. This is the compassion part. You're going to hold that person in your mind and give them some time before you even meet with them. And during the meeting, you're going to reestablish trust, so you're still building the connection with them. This is probably not the relationship they were expected at work, that you would be so interested in them, maybe. And you're going to set the emotional tone. And you're going to ask them what they've been thinking about since you last met. Um, and as they talk about their strengths, you can also share your view of their strengths and uh, have a conversation about the, the strengths, the similarities or differences, and really start to really help your direct report understand what their strengths are and to, and to feel what that's like. Um, and maybe have some conversation about how that impacts their work, how do their strengths impact their work. And now you're going to set them up for their next assignment. And there are two assignments, two exercises. One is the career lifeline. Yep. yep. And the other is the leadership self-study. So first I'll go over a career lifeline. And this is a pretty simple exercise. Either they can just draw a line across the page, and at the right list their most recent or current job, which is where they should be right now. And at the left, they're going to work backwards um, in descending order of past jobs. Now, for people who are, have direct reports who have been working a long time, this is fairly straightforward. If you have direct reports who are fairly young or for whom this is their first job, I'd encourage them to put down any work they've ever had. So paid, unpaid, volunteer. What you're trying to do with them is to help them get a sense of where they are now and the patterns that have uh, cropped up across the activities they've done and the jobs they've done. Um, and when they're going through the jobs, if they notice a job, you'll be able to talk more about it. The next activity is a leadership self-study. And for this activity, I'm actually going to talk to you as the manager first about you doing it, and then I'll go over how to help your direct report do it. But a leadership self-study is a chance to get some feedback about your leadership style and about how what your impact is on people. So you get some real feedback. And you think about two to four people who will be honest and supportive of you, um, who, who know you and know your work pretty well, and you're going to go for a walk and talk with them for about 30 minutes. And this is really a chance to get a view of yourself that you don't typically, typically get and a conversation with a 
person who can be a mentor or a peer that you usually don't take time to do. And you're going to ask them three questions. What do you notice when you interact with me? What three things do you appreciate most about me? And what three things would you like me to do differently to be more effective? And at the end of the conversation, or when you get home from the conversation, I'd encourage you to take about 15 minutes and just jot down what you took away from each conversation. So you'll end up with two to four pages of notes about this, the leadership self-study. And when you, if you go through the exercise, you'll have an experience that you'll be able to both share and understand when your direct report goes through. And when you encourage your direct report to do it, I think one of the most important things is helping them figure out who to go with, to talk with, so that they can get some feedback that's really helpful. And also to, coach them a little bit about how to set up the conversation. They may be a little bit nervous about asking these questions. And so you might have them role play the questions with you or actually do the conversation with them so that they have some practice in asking the questions and getting some feedback with somebody who knows them pretty well and is really interested in their development. So now, after they've gone away and done the work and come back, you get to have a follow-up conversation about both the Career Lifeline and the Leadership Self-Study. And the Career Lifeline, ideally they'll bring in the sheet of paper or you can recreate it in the office. And it would be, it'd be really helpful to go and look at each point on the line and ask them if they haven't described it to you in describing their lifeline. So what, what are three things they took away from each job? What strengths did they notice in themselves? Uh, and what, what strengths did they pick up on their career lifeline. And then from the leadership self-study, what themes did they notice in their conversations? In the conversation as the manager, you get to use, um, you know, all the listening skills we covered in the last session, listening, paraphrasing, really checking in. Did you want, do you really understand what they're trying to explain to you? And then slowing down here and there and getting them to be able to summarize. So, all right, let's just check in. What are you getting from this conversation so far so that it can stay at a pace that feels good? On the slideshow, we have a possible conversation that I'm not going to read to you because you're all capable of reading, but if you get to the place where you're about to have these conversations with your direct ports, they can be really helpful as a conversation starter. After you have this conversation with them and you've looked at the themes of their strengths and you've looked at the themes of their careers, the next task is that you're going to send them away with the assignment of coming up with their own personal balance sheet, where they get to look at all the information, both from the aspirations work they did and then the real self, the career lifeline and leadership self-study work they did, and really start to make a list of their strengths, their potential strengths, and their enduring dispositions that both support them and hinder them, as well as their challenges. And, you know, when we talk about enduring dispositions, we're really talking about the things that are both, you know, in some ways that are so enduring that they are both our strengths and weaknesses. You know, for me, for example, um, I have a lot of energy, which means that I can often get a lot done, but it often means I can say yes to too much. So I have to manage that enduring disposition in a way that supports me and doesn't get in my way. Excellent. That's a lot to cover. Yes. Well, thank you, Gretchen, and there's a <clears> – <throat> this will be available to you, this webinar, um, so you'll have these, these things spelled out for you. Um, and as you'll see, you, you can find ways to uh, – you can see what's coming next in the next webinar. Where we'll be helping you put all this together so you can identify developmental goals and shepherd those through with people and support them. So we'll stop here. It's 3 o'clock, and we're so happy you joined us. Um, we – there's an upcoming Ripple webinar here that Nick might want to explain, and then we'll put on the last slide if you need to, to, need to or want to contact us about anything or the content from this. We welcome your, your email. Great. Well, thank you both so much. That was, that was incredibly helpful um, and very, very insightful. Um, and we will look forward to, to having you guys back again. We, um, 
we don't have a date set yet, but it'll be um, sometime in January when you will sort of bring all these different threads together. Um, in the meantime, um, on on December 13th, in a couple of weeks, we have we have Scott Ablin coming up, who will kind of talk about how do you find those moments when it's appropriate to coach. I think that um, you know a lot of the a lot of the great material that you've provided here um, works really well for managers who kind of have regular meetings with their direct reports, and we certainly in, encourage that. But it's sort of um, Scott will be talking about how do you kind of uh, figure out those opportune times when the people that you're working with are mo are open and receptive um, to the kind of feedback that is going to help them uh, be more successful, help them be more engaged, and ultimately help you as a manager, um, you know, deliver the results you need to deliver. Um, so once again, thank you all for, for joining us, and thank you especially, uh, Suzanne and, and Gretchen, for your time and for your thoughtful presentation. Thank you so much for having us. I'm sorry we went a couple minutes over. Thanks, um, Nick. And we will uh, look forward to the next one when we bring it all together. <laughs>